Welcome everyone to the Maxon booth here at NAB 2022, last day of the show, so we're bringing out the heavy hitters. To my left, a longtime friend, amazing educator, all around, one of the cutest artists too, like he makes cute things, if you haven't seen any of his work, very, very cute things. <laughs> EJ Hassan Fresh, everybody, let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you, thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you everyone who came out today on the last day, we're like, just kind of crawling towards the end of NAB. Hello everyone online, love you all out there. Uh, my name is EJ Hassenfratz. I'm a creative director over at School of Motion. We're an online education uh, website where we teach all types of MoGraphy things from animation to design to 3D. Uh, I teach a couple of classes over there. Uh, one's called Cinema 40 Ascent, uh, uh, Base Camp and one's called Cinema 40 Ascent. So if you're very new to Cinema 4D or 3D in general, Cinema 4D Base Camp's basically like, okay, I'm finally going to learn 3D and I'm gonna do it for reals this time. Uh, because really it's like, it's a, it's a really nice boot camp. It'll kick your butt, but at the end you'll come out and you'll actually know 3D, all the mo most important foundational concepts. Uh, and the best part about uh, what we do at School of Motion is you're not gonna learn alone. You're gonna learn with all types of artists from all over the world and you have teaching assistants. So, if you ever have any questions while you're going through content, like you're gonna get that support. So it's really cool. It's almost like being in a, you know, a, a little cohort or something like that. And Ascent is a more of a, an advanced uh, course where it's like, okay, I took, I know 3D, uh, I know some of the stuff, but like, what can I do with 3D now? And I think as you learn a new skill, that's the second hardest thing. Is like you you know 3D, but it's like, okay, well, what? How do I apply that to my own work? And that's kind of all what Ascent is about. So check those out if you wanna. Uh, beef up your C4D uh, skills. Uh, but me personally, I've been using Cinema 4D for about 12 years now, uh, and I've been kind of teaching it for the last, let's see, nine years or something like that. Uh, and why it is is that I know that one of the most common things I hear is people think of 3D and they immediately think that's way too hard. And I thought the same exact thing until I started using Cinema 4D and it just made sense. Like it's, I always call it an artist tool. It allows you to just get in and create, it gets out of your way. It's not overly technical. Uh, and I don't know if C4D didn't exist, I don't even know if I would have gotten to see uh, into 3D maybe way later, but uh, it just it was super accessible. Plus all the integration with all the Adobe products is really great as well. Um, but just to give you a little bit of an idea of what type of work I do and uh, the kind of tutorials I do, uh, I will show you my reel. So let me get that up here really quick. Uh oh, I think the audio is a little off. Oh, wow. It's a little echoey. So yeah, I do a lot of cute things, giant eyeballs, that's kind of my thing. Uh, that song sounds way cooler when the audio is working, trust me. Um, but uh, basically, what we're gonna be doing today is whoo, nature bashing. Uh, so a lot of people know about kit bashing, where you get a bunch of assets from different uh, 3D websites and you bash them together. Uh, kit bashing is actually from uh, like when they made the original Star Wars and you would get all these like model kits and you'd bash all these models together to create the Death Star model and all that kind of stuff. So that's a form of uh, technique that is used in 3D all the time these days because not everyone has time to model everything from scratch. So you kind of bring in things and you tell uh, a, a nice unique story using uh, pre-made assets. So what we're going to be doing today is I'm going to show you my process for 
uh, nature bashing this scene right here. So we start out with a landscape. We kind of add all this ground cover, uh, plants. Uh, we add in like hero elements. We add in trees, maybe a Sasquatch. Uh, but I just want to show you how easy this is uh, inside of Redshift. And uh, this is one question I get all the time. What render do you, do, you, do you use? And I always think that's the wrong question to ask. Uh, because it really doesn't matter what render you use. That's like asking a, a painter, what brush do you use? It's not about the brush. It's about how talented the artist is that's using the brush. So right now, like, all the renderers are like, really powerful. Some have some specialty, some things they're really good at uh, more than others. But I would always suggest anyone who is new to third-party rendering to just go out and try, try all of them. I know so many artists that actually know way uh, more than one uh, renderer. I started learning with Octane, and then I switched over to Redshift. Uh, and if you're used to all the native renderers inside of Cinema 4D, like the physical and the standard render, I actually think Redshift is kind of a continuation of that thought process of how those renderers work, uh, because they are uh, biased renderers, which means that you can break physical reality rules and like make something looking pretty stylistic where bias renderers, uh, you're kind of like stuck with, this is how a light works in real life, and you really can't fudge that kind of stuff up uh, with like lights and stuff like that. So just my little PSA on the, the render war thing. So uh, let me actually bring up what the final thing we're going to be making today will look like. <laughs> Now the audio is working really nice. So let me do repeat, and this, and this. So, so yeah, I made this little nice nature scene with this hero element. It's a pug statue, because I got a pug, and I love pugs. They're the best. Uh, and I just loved uh, this kind of style of scene. And when you're trying to approach really anything, I really highly recommend that you uh, get resources, get, uh, go on Pinterest, and try to figure out what you want. Because one of the most important things is narrowing your focus so you can kind of figure out what you want, have a more narrow path of, of the type of art that you want to do. If you just go and you sit down and you're like, I want to make something, but I don't know what to make because I could literally make anything. Uh, once you start honing things down, and like I, I was like, I know I want to maybe do some kind of, you know, Japanese forest, like super green, mossy. I went on Pinterest and just started looking at stuff. And through Pinterest, uh, looking at all these nice, uh, nice nature shots, I found these little Buddha statues, and I was like, that's super cool. And these are called like uh, Jizo statues, and I had to go down a rabbit hole to figure out what they meant. They're little, like little baby Buddhas, and I was like, okay, that's cool. I want to have like. Maybe that's the focal element. Of course, I had to make it like a pug-looking thing. Uh, but the one thing I found going through these mood boards is like, I really like some aspects of the things I was seeing. Like, I like the super saturated green. I like how hazy and foggy it looked. Uh, and then like the nice, uh, nice mossy ground cover. And then especially when you're uh, trying to recreate nature, it's always great to actually see what nature looks like. Uh, so seeing like what makes this look realistic, well, it's not like we have a bunch of the same rocks in here. We have a few varieties of different sizes of rocks, and the trees all look somewhat different. Uh, in this scene, we have different sizes of plants. We have this nice ground cover. We have an occasional uh, twig on the ground. So all those little details really, really help. Um, so these are the things that I always use to uh, kind of in help inform the, the piece that I was working on. Plus, these little god rays are really cool. Uh, so that's kind of the vibe I was going for. So uh, I went over and I, I presented on Sunday. And on Sunday, I kind of went over this process here. So I really don't want to cover it from scratch, but I'll just give you a nice little breakdown and then kind of speed through uh, to the next part of the presentation. But how I built the basic landscape was super simple. I, would, I was utilizing a lot of the uh, deformer tools, the MoGraph tools. And basically what I did is I just started out with a ground plane. And one important thing I want to cover is 
Let me actually get these textures off so you can just see the subdivisions here. So this is just a highly subdivided uh, plane object. It's very big. If I zoom out here, very big. And you can see there's this little figure object. And you might be wondering, well, why do I have this little guy in here? Well, this is actually just to get a sense of scale and to make sure that what you're building is scaled to real world units. So when you're using third party renderers, uh, like Redshift, Octane, whatever, they're physically based. So if you have a light, the light values like are in centimeters. And if, they're, if your scene's off, if your scene's too big or too small, sometimes your lighting will look really weird. And sometimes you might have to really crank up like your light intensity to compensate for the fact that your scene's so big. So when you actually are basing things off of a real world scale, this figure object, which you can find right in here, is actually based off of a six foot human. So when you start placing plant elements and stuff like that, you have this sense of scale, this, uh, this kind of reference point that you can start scaling everything in your scene to. So once I had that, I got my ground plane. And then once I start, I, what I started to do is start to add like little organic uh, displacements on the ground. So I have a displacer here. I have a uh, noise within the shader, scaled fairly big. And if I turn that on, you can see what kind of detail uh, we have there. And then what I like to do is kind of layer up details, because like I said, everything in nature isn't just you know, looking like one exact thing. So that means that like, you can't say all dirt looks like one type of noise in a 3D app. Like, no, you can, there's a lot of uh, variation, a lot of organic details there. So what I ended up doing was adding a little bit more detail with the, the smaller detail with a, a smaller noise. And then what I ended up doing was adding big hills that is basically, this is a displacer with just a color shader in here. And this is actually just turning the displacer effect full on. And then what I ended up doing is using the spherical fields to control where that displacement's happening. So now I can art direct, like, where, is, where are my hills? How many hills do I have? And this is a lot more art directable than using a, uh, like a landscape object where you're kind of stuck with you know, a limited amount of controls. Kind of building that landscape from scratch is, is really nice. And then what I ended up doing as well is controlling where these uh, displacements are happening uh, using this spline. So basically, I'm using this spline as a mask. And if I move this spline, here's the spline right here. You can see that's flattening everything out. And what this allows me to do is if I just put another plane down here, I have this like path leading the, like, a path that's leading the viewer's eye to my main uh, character here. So I'm just kind of figuring out what this composition will look like. And the nice part about this is if I want to say, like, maybe I want the main focus to be over here, I can just rotate this spline and then, like, okay, I'll put the figure over here instead. And, like, now we have this nice uh, path leading the eye here, maybe going back here, maybe put some trees, all that kind of stuff. So maximum flexibility is what Cinema 4D is all about, using a bunch of displacers and fields that control where everything is. The next thing I did was I added a bunch of textures and some of these plants. So w one of the things I, I leaned on heavily is uh, an app called Quixel Bridge. And they're actually owned by Epic, uh, if you've heard on Unreal Engine, uh, all that kind of stuff. This is a bunch of 3D scanned 3D assets that are actually free to use. You have to just sign up for an Epic account. Uh, super easy to do, and they just have amazing, amazing textures that are, again, 3D scans. They have 3D models that are 3D scans. So you got these rocks. You got these little clusters of rocks. And the great thing about this is, is that, remember I was saying that everything in nature looks different. You don't have the same rock 50 times. It's a bunch of different rocks, right? So this is where you can source all that kind of stuff. So what I like to do is, when I'm, when I'm bringing assets into my scene, instead of using like 15 different assets, I'll just use like three. So what I'll have is, let's see, let's do these purchase ones. Uh, for plants, I'll do like a big, medium, and small plant. So here's my like ground cover, which would be the small. And this looks a lot like that, uh, like all this mossy stuff right here. 
So that, and then let's go back into bridge. And then I have these medium little palm, lady palms, uh, that are going to be like the medium sized plants. And you can see how many different, we got six different, or actually five, yeah, five different types of plants. And then we have, what, eight, nine, ten, ten different plants over here. And then for the ferns, that's like my bigger plant detail. There's just so many uh, plants that you can start using. And again, once you layer in these different looking ferns and different looking plants, it's going to look really, really natural. So I downloaded all that kind of stuff. And then, the way you can get uh, all this stuff over from Quixel Bridge to Cinema 4D is actually super easy. Uh, let's see. Because what you can end up doing is you can install, let me switch here, because we don't have good internet. <laughs> as long as you have uh, Redshift chosen as your renderer, or whatever render you're using, make sure that that's set in your render settings. Because what you can do is you can hop inside of Quixel Bridge. And then actually go and let me get this cursor out of the way. You can export, let me just show you on the actual app. You can choose this. You can go down here and say, export settings. I want to export to Cinema 4D. And there's like all types of apps that you can actually export these assets to. You can even choose like uh, what, what channels, what material channels do you want to export out with these as well. So you have like so much flexibility, the level of detail of your models. Level of detail zero is your highest level of detail. Um, so you can keep your scene fairly, fairly light. And so I click on this, and then I can just go and download it first. And you can choose what resolution you want the textures to be. And then I just click Export. And this isn't actually connected right. Uh, but let's go back to the actual video showing this. When you actually have that plugin uh, installed in Cinema 4D correctly, you can Export, and then open Cinema 4D, and that Material, for example, will pop right up. And it will have all of your, your albedo, your roughness, your normal, your transmission, your displacement. It will all be pumped in and be converted to a Redshift material, which is really cool. You don't have to manually set this up. Like If you download a texture from any site, you have to download all the individual bump maps and roughness maps and then plug them all in yourself. But this export does it all for you, which is amazing, because you don't have to waste your time doing all that kind of stuff. Uh, so I downloaded a few, a couple uh, ground textures and applied them to, to my, uh, my landscape and then that little path object here. And then I did the same exact thing with these plants. You can export the models, and they will also come in with their their uh, node, tree, node tree is intact, which is really, really awesome. Everything's already set up. Even the little sprite node that kind of cuts out uh, a, a mat with that. And then what I can do with these different ground elements, let me actually I'll hide the broadleaf. Let me just use these uh, little elements here. These are all my ground cover mossy bits. I'm going to go and scatter these all throughout my scene to create a nice like, blanket of these uh, little plants. So to do that, I can do this very easily and actually keep my viewport very light by using something called a Redshift Scatter. And if you've updated to S26, you'll notice there's no more uh, Redshift uh, dropdown up here. You can actually get that back. And I always like to have that up here. So to fix that, I'm going to go to Edit Preferences. And I'm going to go to Renderer, Redshift. And if you turn on Redshift Main Menu, boop, you'll see it right up there, as long as you have uh, Redshift selected as your renderer. So that's a nice way to get that back. And so now what I can do is go up to the Redshift Menu, go to Objects, and go to Matrix Scatter. And what this is going to do is basically create a matrix object. And what I can do with this is right now it's just scattering as a grid. I actually want to make all these matrices be on top of uh, an object, and that object is going to be my ground. You can see all these little matrices here, and the count's set to 20 right now. But if I crank this up, I can crank this up like super high, like 800,000, and you can see all of those little matrices there. Okay? So what you can do with this Redshift scatter is have these matrices as like visual placeholders, 
and at render time actually render out an object where all of these little uh, matrices are. So to do that, I'm going to go up into my uh, Redshift matrix, go to particles, and right now the mode is set to optimize spheres. What I want to do is set this to custom objects. And now I can actually define what objects I want to show up where uh, all these matrices are, at least in, at render time. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to lock this view, and I'm going to select all of these little sorrel plants. They're named really weird. They're not really defined, but they're these little ground cover bits. I'm going to drag and drop all these in here. And then what I can do is there's some really nice settings in here that I can have these kind of be generated randomly. So instead of sequentially having this plant, and then this plant, and this, and this plant, this, 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 and then going back to the top, I can actually have these being generated randomly from this list. So we get that nice randomization. And let's actually fire up a render here to see all of these plants show up where all these matrices are. So let's go to our Redshift render view. And let's hit the preview button. And we'll let it, it's got to load up the textures and all that good stuff. And there we go, look at that. We have a ton of ground cover here. And the great thing about this is, again, all of these are applied at render time. So I can still have my viewport super light. And look how quick that updates. Like, that's incredible. We have nearly a million of these little plants in this scene. And our scene is, like, super light. So what we can do with this is we can either scale down everything with this scale multiplier. So if I do 0.5, it's going to shrink everything down by half. You're also going to notice that, actually, all of my plants are kind of facing towards us. They're rotated oddly. So we can fix that really easily by going over to the Redshift matrix, uh, going up to, well, I still have this lock, so I'm going to unlock that. Go to the Redshift matrix, go to Transform. And I believe if I do negative 90, this will have everything facing upwards. Looking good. That looks great. And I can also, like, if, if things are intersecting, I can just move these up in Y by, like, two centimeters. Actually, that just moved that the opposite way. Yeah. So I, since I rotated them, the values are a little weird. Which, what's X, what's Y, what's Z? So I think this needs to be two right here. And this will just move everything up. Now it's going to move it up 21. I didn't mean to do 21. Let's do two. But you can offset the plant so the stems are actually on the ground, which is really nice. Well, we have like a ton of these plants. And you can see they're kind of intersecting uh, the ground here. So we can actually art direct where these plants are showing up. We can say, actually, in this area here, like don't place any of those plants. So to do that, I can go to my Redshift matrix object. I can right click, go to MoGraph tags, go to MoGraph selection. And here, I can go, actually, not Redshift Selection. Hold on. Do MoGraph Tags. Yeah, MoGraph Selection. That's what I want. And MoGraph, MoGraph, Cash, MoGraph Selection. And, and then there should be a way to go in here. And I can, like, select all of these different points. And let me actually just pause this render so I can work a little more efficiently in my viewport. Just close out of this for now. I can adjust this radius, go in here, and I can just paint. Like, wherever I'm painting, I want to say, remove those matrices. So get all those. And then what I'm going to do at this point is with that MoGraph selection, I can go up to MoGraph, and I can go to Hide Selected. And then what that's going to do, you can see all those matrices went away. And that's because it generated a uh, plane object that <coughs> excuse me, uh, has the parameter of the visibility just turned off. So if I turn this on, turn this off, we're just hiding all of those uh, all those little matrices. And I can go back up to Redshift Render View, update this. And you should see, once this updates, 
all of those uh, little plant cover be gone. So there they go. So you can still go in here, remove, add, art direct, that kind of stuff. And again, this is super fast uh, in your viewport. Now, there is another way to uh, be able to see what all this stuff is and still have a speedy viewport. And that is by uh, kind of bypassing the Redshift matrix object and using a cloner instead. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to command click and drag to duplicate this matrix object. And there's this really handy feature that you can go up to your MoGraph uh, menu here and say swap, uh, swap the cloner to a matrix or the matrix to a cloner. So I'm going to do that. And you'll see that this matrix object is now a cloner object. And what I can do is drag and drop all of those plants underneath the cloner, set this to multi-instance, because this is really going to save everything, like store everything in uh, like cache. And so you saw all that update. And then what I can do is I can use this visual preview as a replacement for this Redshift matrix. And I can clone a plant everywhere there is a matrix by cloning this. Instead of the ground, I can clone this onto the Redshift matrix. And you'll see that update slightly. And now you have this like nice visual preview of all of your plants, but you'll see because we have 800,000 of these visualized in our viewport, that it's going to slow down our viewport a little bit here. So this is just good for like visually seeing what's going on when you're, when you're actually like, OK, this actually looks good. You can just turn this off again and then just go back to using that matrix object and just render at render time. Okay? So I did this technique with, <coughs> with um, the other types of plants. And then what you want to do at that point is you got the ground cover, you got your medium plants. What I'm going to do is start adding in trees. And a lot of people can use Forester, all that type of stuff. But if you don't want to buy Forester, there's actually a lot of assets within not only the uh, Redshift, or not only the, the asset browser in Cinema 4D, but also in Bridge. If you search for tree. The thing about uh, Quixel Bridge is that there's not like forester looking trees. Like you have the tree trunk, which is great if you're not panning up and trying to see leaves or something like that. Uh, but what I found this was great for was getting some dead tree assets in here or like some twigs or whatever. Or again, because they have these trunks that are you can only see from the bottom, like the roots up. I was like, OK, well, if I, move, if I get a couple of these and move them close to the foreground, that could be like a nice hero detailed tree. And then in the background, they can be like lower poly trees because you're kind of selling that effect. So you don't need high poly, high detailed elements that are way back in your scene. That's just kind of a waste of detail. So I kind of got some of these assets in here. And then in Cinema 4D, if I search for tree in the asset browser, there's a whole bunch of trees in here as well. And what I ended up doing was getting a few of the trees here, the, this hornbeam tree, and then this uh, like baby hornbeam. Because again, in a forest, you're not going to have all the same old, mature trees. You're going to have some young ones, some dead ones. So again, that's, what I, uh, that's exactly what I did, was get all those different types of trees in here. And then at this point, uh, when you bring in your tree, they have uh, just your standard C4D materials applied to it. So you actually need to uh, convert these to Redshift. And the way to do that is super easy. All you need to do is go to Redshift, uh, Materials, Tools, and go to Convert and Replace Materials. And then what this just did was, in a click of a button, converted those to Redshift materials. And the only thing you need to do at this point is let me just choose these, like get a little view here with all these leaves, and then go and fire up the Redshift render view. The one thing that is great about Redshift uh, materials is that it has this thing called uh, translucency. And you can see in the shadows of these leaves, they're super dark. Now, we all know if you look at a leaf, there's a lot of light passing through and scattering through the other side. 
And that's exactly what this backlighting translucency can help with. It can create that effect of like a very thin sheet of paper and the light going through it and being illuminated. And all we need to do to get that is you can see my, uh, my actual leaf material is in this diffuse shader that's getting pumped into this diffuse uh, texture node. All I need to do is I can reuse that texture and put this into the translucency color. And you're not going to see anything happen. Once I go to the Redshift Material node, right now there's no weight to it. But pay attention to all these dark areas. If I crank this up to 1, see how that brightens everything up? We got a little bit of that translucency going through. And this looks much more, more realistic. So when you're dealing with leaves and, and plants and stuff like that, you want to have some of this translucency. Otherwise, it's going to look kind of cruddy and like muddy because you should have that kind of like translucency passing through there. So that's the only change I needed to do with all these materials. These other materials for the bark, they already have uh, like your bump map added and all that stuff. So you don't even need to touch those. And then at this point, doo -doo -doo. Whoop, that opened in uh, R25. Don't want to do that. Yes. So here are my trees. They already got converted. So I got a, <clears throat> I got this dead tree right here from Quixel. Because again, not all trees in a forest are going to be nice and new. There are going to be some dead ones there. And then I got this little baby tree and then a big tree with uh, a lot of branches. And now what I can do with all these trees, I'm going to just move these down below my scene here. What I can do with all of these is scatter all three of these different trees throughout this scene to really start filling it up. And the way you can do that is using what's called the scatter placement tool. This was added in S24. And it's super cool. I actually still know a lot of people that don't know about this or they've you know, never used it before. And it's already it's been there for a year now. Uh, but how it works is I can click the scatter tool. And you can see there's this little you know, circle. And what I can do is right now I can say, OK, whatever objects I have selected, I'm going to load that up into my scatter brush. And then what I can do at this point is up this radius. And that's, see how that sphere got bigger? And I can go in, and you can see how this is kind of, if I click and drag, I can start scattering all these trees throughout the scene. You can see how they're aligning to the, to the, uh, the angle or the normals of the surface. You don't want that. You don't have trees kind of you know, align like that in nature, at least not that I've seen. Uh, maybe if you drink too much in Vegas, you might start seeing trees that look like that. Uh, but you want them just uh, going straight up. And how you can do that is saying, don't align to the surface, align to just the object. And then what you can do is now all these trees are going to stand straight up. And then even when I just painted like that, I can go in here and adjust the radius here. The bigger the radius, the more like personal space they have. Same thing with this object spacing. If I start going negative, you can see this is shrinking this red circle, which again is this buffer zone where there will only be one tree within this little buffer zone area. So if I really shrink this down, you can really start to fill up this scene and scatter all these bunch of trees. And like with just a simple brush stroke, you can paint a bunch of trees faster than Bob Ross. Okay? So what we can do at this point as well is we have these little position min max rotation range. And these will allow you to actually add random rotation to all of your trees as you scatter them. So again, all these trees are going to look really weird if they're all rotated the same way. But if we turn in like 3,600, we got that rotation. Also, we can adjust the min and max scale. So that means that the, the minimum scale will be half the size of the original tree size. And then we can crank up the 100%. And this will be like 143% of the original size. So you've got that variation in scale as well. So this is looking really good. But what if you're like, OK, well, I like some of these trees, but there's just way too many clustered here. I want to delete some. Well, you can do that very easily by either going to this Remove tab and just start painting, and that will actually remove stuff. Or you can actually hit the uh, Control key, hold the Control key down, and start 
just painting over, and that will delete some of these as well. Now, since I have the landscape object kind of in the way, I'm going to just turn those off real quick, and I can start removing some of these trees here. So you can easily add. You can easily, uh, easily remove trees. Let me turn back on the plane objects. And you can even like move some of these trees as well. So if you're like, actually, all this looks good, I just want to move this tree over a little bit. Well, you can see this scatter object is here. And that's actually containing all of these trees that we just scattered. And you can see there's this edit mode. And if I check that on, you can see all those little circles go away. And I can actually use this uh, place tool. And what the place tool will do, if I select one of these trees, you can see that tree is highlighted now. I can click and drag and just move this wherever I want. Again, this is aligning to the surface, so I'll Command-Z to undo that. And what I'll say is actually keep the orientation, have that tree maintain its uh, y-axis being straight up. And I can even offset this a little bit to like, go pass through the ground a little bit. And I can move this over like this. Maybe move that down a little bit more. But now I can really start to art direct the scene, build my composition, and really like create a, a huge forest scene super quick. So the nice thing about moving this is you can also, there's this little gizmo here. If I hover over this uh, cube, this will scale everything up. And I can rotate this by using this rotation band. So like you could just really fine tune what this, uh, what this scene looks like. So super cool. So what I did next was just start layering, layering up details, right? So let's go, and I'll show you a bunch of the assets I used from Quixel. Whoop. So again, it's loading up all these textures here. I can show in Bridge some of my favorite stuff that I used. So the nice thing about uh, Quixel is you can actually like favorite things. So you, you can like figure out which ones you used. So I used this to be a, like a nice hero element that will be closer to the camera. Uh, all these different rocks. I had like a placeholder statue, this cool stone pillar, just to add some like nice hero elements. And so here are all of the Quixel Bridge elements. Again, when you export all of those assets out, the materials are already applied. We've got our displacement already set up as well in our bump. And you can see all the Redshift tags are added as well. Now, you will have to manually turn on all of your displacement, uh, all your displacement uh, inside of your uh, Redshift tag. And I'll show you really quickly why that is. So if I go to Redshift Render View, let's fire this up. Make this a little, yeah. So there's all of our assets. Let's really zoom into this one right here. And right now, there's no displacement on it at all. But you can see I have all these Redshift tags. Let me just orient the, and orientate them so I can select them all really quickly. And to turn on displacement, I have to turn on this override and then turn on enable displacement. And this will then add that nice displacement detail. And you can change these values. This is like, what's that maximum displacement that you can have? And this displacement scale is a modifier for like the strength, the overall strength of that uh, displacement. So if I turn this off, you can see how flat that looks and unrealistic. And when we turn on the, sub uh, on the uh, displacement, you get all that nice displaced detail. And so all that displacement happens at render time. So you, again, you're not bogged down. You're not bogging down your uh, your scene. So let's go and let's grab this file here. And so what I did was I just brought in a whole bunch of these Quixel assets. You can see I have this hero tree, which again is that nice hot, that detailed uh, tree, but it's missing the trunk. So this was perfect for me to just be like, all right, let's just move this in the foreground. And we got this really cool root detail there. And we got these dead trees. I can go and place these. I'm going to use the, uh, the placement tool. 
and just kind of move these around and let's undo that and make sure we have that keep orientation. So we can just place this. I can command click and drag to duplicate that and place that back here. I can rotate that. And what that's going to do is automatically create an instance, which is basically just referencing that uh, initial object again to optimize RAM so you can uh, keep your scene nice and light. Place this over here, place all these rocks. And at this point, I'm just like building up the composition and something that can help you with building a nice composition is inside your camera, once you like compose your shot, you can go into your composition tab, enable these helpers, and I have this like golden spiral. So I was like, what I was trying to do is like, whoop, what I'm trying to do is kind of build this shot where, yikes, there we go, I, sl I selected multiple objects there, just kind of placing objects that have your eye kind of go along this line. So like I'll place a rock right here, and then I'll place a rock over here, and maybe uh, you know have this tree element here add to that nice curve. So it's, again, following that golden spiral. And then your hero element will be, be right with this little swirl at the end of the yellow brick road right there, right? So let's go, and I'll show you what my composition looked like at the very end here. You can see I got this nice little pug statue, which I'll, I'll show you how I built that very quickly. But that's like my main hero element. And you can see how I placed all these objects. Here's my like hero tree. We got the little root in the scene. There's my pillar. Let's actually fire off a render here. And you can just see how I positioned all these assets to help lead the eye. You got this nice path also leading the eye to this main hero element here, OK? So you can see that this looks kind of cruddy because there's absolutely no lighting in the scene right now. So let's cover how I lit this. So let me just dock this to the side here. And how I started building up the lighting, actually, I got a slide for this. I have a very important message about lighting. Let's go down here. So this quote, I'm not sure where I found it or if I made it up uh, when I was having being inspired, but I, it just it's something I wrote down and I, it really spoke to me. Lighting is literally how you see an object both visually and, and emotionally. So I, I always say lighting is the most important aspect of a three, for a 3D artist. I know a lot of artists that come from 2D backgrounds using After Effects, you very rarely ever have to light. Uh, and it's kind of this whole new concept. And so I understand that like that could be one of your biggest weakness one of your biggest weaknesses as you become a 3D artist and you start playing around in 3D. Uh, but I'll tell you, some of the most talented 3D artists I know come from a photography background where they've actually used lights in a real studio and they, they know how lighting works and how you can use uh, lights. Um, so I, I really highly recommend that if you're, if you're kind of weak at lighting, check out tutorials on lighting, not lighting in Cinema 4D or lighting in Octane or lighting in Retro. How do you light? And you'll, you'll check out people like studio photographers, and you'll see their area lights and how they use them. And all of those concepts translate directly over to 3D and, and how, how you can use lights. So really highly recommend that if you learn one skill when you start using 3D, learn lighting, your work is going to really, really stand out. Uh, so back to actually lighting the scene. Uh, I'm going to go in, let's just grab a Redshift sun and, uh, sun and Sky Rig. And what this is going to do is add this like nice atmospheric uh, background and this nice uh, sunlight. And if I select the sunlight here and hit R, actually, let me move this so I actually see this in my scene here. So there you go. So how this Redshift uh, sunlight is working is based off of like uh, a parallel infinite light that is trying to mimic the sun. So you can't, if I move this around, you're not going to see anything in the scene change. How you can change the angle of the light of the sun is just hitting the R key and rotating this around. So you can see how you can, depending on how you rotate the sun, you can get these like really nice lights being cast, really nice shadows being cast as well. And you can kind of just go for whatever kind of composition you want. And it's cool as you actually have the sun lower to the horizon, you can see you're getting that like golden hour orangish cast in your scene. So like you can get, again, 
Lighting is how you see an object literally and emotionally. You can, depending on the angle of the light, really change the mood and the vibe and the emotion of your scene. So this is just kind of how I laid out the initial lighting and I get this to look OK. So we've got this really nice uh, shadows being cast. We can go into the redshift sky. You can kind of crank up the intensity here and brighten everything up. You can also do this red-blue hue shift, which is kind of interesting, where you can get this like uh, nice tint as this updates. So again, injecting color. Think of all the emotion attached to color that you can start uh, injecting in your scene as well. So we got this base lighting here. Uh, what I did next was added some spotlights. And what I wanted to do is create, here's my spotlight here. What I wanted to do is basically use these spotlights to help kind of shine more light into the scene through the trees and try to create some like god ray type of stuff. So you're not actually seeing any volumetric light in our scene right now because to see volume to add volumetric light, we need to create a redshift uh, environment. And then as this updates, boom, client loves this. Let's, let's, let's iterate off this. So what's happening right now is that the redshift sun is actually contributing to this massive overblown volume and I actually don't want to have any uh, volume contribution to this scene. So I'm going to go and just crank down this volume down to zero. And so we won't get any volume contribution there. And so now you can start to see these little shafts of light coming from our spotlight here. And what's happening is this is being cast through all of these leaves. And this is where you're getting these cool, uh, oops, these cool god rays, right? And that's all from the redshift environment. So this is like super, this is like way too bright. You can see how this adds this cool vibe. So what I can do on the redshift spotlight is you could go into the details tab and like bring down the volume contribution there. You can see that's almost like a, an opacity slider for this effect, but you can actually go into the redshift environment and there's all these settings that control these, uh, the scattering the light, the, the fall off of the, of the uh, volumetric light. And the one thing about redshift and volumetric lighting is it's so fast. Like I can move this, uh, oops, not, not like that. I think I just rotated into a tree. So I can move like this. It'll just update super, super fast. Uh, so if I go back into the Redshift environment, you have this scattering, which is basically you can think of just your overall intensity. So you can bring this down to like 0 0.02, and that will update here. You can change the tint. And again, this is where I really leaned heavily on the mood boards that I had. You can get this nice hazy yellowish green, lime green effect. So you can also pump that into the actual tint here and get this nice limey green type of tint. Because no light in nature is completely white. So to make it look realistic, you need to inject a little bit of you know, yellow from the sun, right? Or if you know, there's a lot of green light getting scattered, you have a little greenish tint. Uh, and then we have this attenuation, which is basically like a light fall off. So I'll bring this up uh, a little bit too. And this should kind of tone down on that a little, like soften everything a little bit. And now we can just start to like rotate this around and seeing what kind of effect we got. We can go into our Redshift uh, spotlight here. And in the Object tab, kind of bring down that cone angle. You can see we're narrowing that focus there. We can change the fall off angle, which is going to feather the edges of the spotlight. So we can have this like narrow shaft of light that See how that just like adds this nice little subtle detail in there? And again, you can just like, OK, maybe I want this more foreground element. Do I want the rays to actually be casting on this hero element? Do I want it to be casting here? So again, like if you imagine the golden ratio arc, it's, we could maybe have that be a little element. So this is looking really nice. 
Uh, and then for this, the spotlight, I can even bring some color into this as well. So maybe some orange, yellow, and maybe up the intensity here. And if I up the intensity of the light, it's going to change the volume as well. That's like super hot, right? So we can go back in this Redshift environment. The last uh, feature here is this phase. Oops, I think I brought the spotlight down too much. It kind of went away. Some of these values can be very finicky. It could just like just touch the slider, and it could just be way too low of a value here. So let's go in here. And the phase is if I have this negative, it's going to have like more volumetrics away from the camera. And if I do positive, there's going to be more volumetrics like closer to the camera. So it's like this phase kind of shift. Actually, I think I switched that back and forth. Negative is close to the camera. Positive is further away. Usually, I don't touch this very much at all. But if I go to uh, this fog, you can actually make this like nice, hazy fog here. Let's really crank this up. And this is just the height of the fog. So think of if you were in like a swamp or something like that. And you can even change the emission color from like black to yeah, dark green. Actually, let's actually bring this up so you can see this in the scene. So see that like orangish haze? And if you adjust this height, that's how high this little haze will be. So again, you can have this like cool little, we can blur this so it doesn't look so harsh. So you can add this like cool little fog element in here. So again, if you're in like a swamp, you got all that like low level like mist. So this is a really cool way to do something like that. And I'll just reset these back. So what I did is I layered up a bunch of these spotlights here. So I had like a foreground spotlight that was yellow, whoop, like this. And then I duplicated, command, click, and drag to duplicate this light and just move this back in the scene, maybe make this a little bit bigger to kind of illuminate the, the background here because it just looks too dark, too drab. Now that looks like that's getting blasted by the Death Star. So let's bring this down here a little bit. We can change the color to more of an orange. But I'm just layering up like the foreground detail, the background detail. And then I will maybe increase the cone angle here. So you just like, get these really nice filtered lights back here. I'm going to duplicate this one more time and try to angle this where this is going to hit back here. And it's just such fast feedback that I can really art direct really quickly. Let's really crank this up. Let's see. Yeah, so there is that light back here. And let's change this to like a more lime green to try to get that nice hue from, uh, from that, that reference image. And let's maybe push this back even more in the scene. So that's a little bit too hot. But you can see how you can layer in and kind of use lights to even draw the attention as well. So this light back here that has this nice like tinge of green is almost like a you know a backlight for this main uh, this main object right here. So this is looking really cool, really moody. But again, this is looking weird because we got this massive branch uh, in the way. So what you could do is find out what tree that is and just move that out of the way using that placement tool, right? Uh, but then to add in and fill in all these little details, what I ended up doing was. I'm going to put this in the oven. It's going to look a lot better. <laughs> so let's get this uh, updating here. So what I did was I had, you know, built in. I got my Redshift Sun casting the main light. Then I added in all those spotlights to bring in all that atmospheric detail. And then what I did to fill in the uh, other details, because you see how dark this looks, I just used a bunch of area lights. And everyone's heard of three-point lighting. Uh, it's, it's said that you, you have your fill light, your key light, uh, your rim light. They're just ways of using lights, not necessarily that you need to use three lights. They're all about how you can use them, not how many. 
So let me actually go in here. I actually want these lights to show up right here. So one shortcut key that you can use to have any object uh, just appear wherever the access center of your selected object is, is holding down the control or command key. And if I go and get a light, area light, that's going to place that area light in the scene. And then it's going to place that right where my object access center is. So now I can just move this out. And this will be, and you can see this is actually contributing to the volume, and I don't want that. So let's go into this area light here and go to the details and bring down the volume. So it's not going to contribute to the, the fog or the anything at all. So now you can see this is just kind of like blasting here. Let's make sure this is looking through our Redshift camera. And at this point, I can just you know shrink this down. Again, add a little bit of color to this light. Maybe a little bit of orange. So I'm just trying to like I'm using these as a bunch of like fill lights basically to fill in the details. And again, you want to know where the source of your light is coming from. So the sunlight, you want this light to be motivated. So you want this light to look like it's also coming from the same angle as the sun. So it looks like it fits in the scene. So that's actually looking really nice. We're kind of getting this detail here. But this side's a little bit dark. So we can rename this as like our key light. We can command click and drag to duplicate this. And this will be our fill to help fill in the darker areas here. So something like this. We'll bring down the intensity. So the fill light is usually a lower intensity than the key. And usually it's placed at like a 90 degree angle on the other side. And so that's adding in this nice little detail. The smaller the light, the harsher the, uh, and sharper the shadows. So it always helps to know how lights work. So if you want a lot of dramatic lighting, you'll want some like harsher shadows to have that nice contrasty lighting. So something like this, maybe make this a little taller and skinny. And then I can duplicate this fill light yet again, and then use this as like a rim light to help us pop that uh, uh, the statue off from the background. So I'll use this other view here. It always helps to have like your locked camera view and this other view that you can just move around in. And then for this, since we have this like greenish hue in the background, maybe this rim light, again, we want to have motivated light. So if there's green lighting from here, maybe we have a little bit of green spill or green hue added to uh, this rim light here. So let's see how this is positioned. Let's bring this up a little bit. And it's never been easier to learn lighting either, just because how quickly you can move a light and see what that light is doing in your scene. It used to be so hard to try to learn the skill of lighting, because each time you'd move a light even the slightest bit, you have to wait a minute to see what that looks like. Now you're waiting seconds. And Jonathan Winbush will tell you that if you're using Unreal, you can do it within milliseconds. Uh, but yeah, real-time rendering and just the speed of which you can render will really allow you to like flex your artistic skill, your, your lighting skills, and your storytelling skills, because you're not worrying about doing something and then waiting for a render. So that's kind of how I built up the lighting. And then uh, you know, I can bring another light here to kind of shine a light on this uh, front statue, or not statue, but pillar. Let's move this. Actually, I can just find. This light, move this back. There we go. Is that light, move it here, move it back. There it is up here. So I can make this small. And then to make this like almost like it has barn doors on it to focus this area light. Let me move 
this here. You can go into the uh, spread on this area light and bring this down. And then it's going to like barn door this to focus this light even more. So I can really start to hit wherever I want to on this statue or this uh, pillar here. So we can get this like nice dramatic lighting, almost like this is filtering through like a tree branch and just highlighting this little area here, which I, that actually looks pretty good. And so just layering up lighting details, using your broad stroke of that sunlight, hitting all this with uh, some little uh, spotlights. And let me just bring up the intensity of the, the light rays so you can see it a little bit better. One last thing I want to show you is how you can actually add, let me just delete that. How you can add, uh, so this is like super bright. How can we add nice, uh, like almost looks like fog where it's a little noisy, cloudy looking? Because right out the box, this is looking just kind of like a glow. So one way you can add that no nice noise and look uh, very cloudy looking is going and selecting the Redshift environment, going to Redshift, uh, Materials, Utilities, and going to Noise Volume. And what this is going to do is create an object that has uh, some noise already that you can then use, like Fractal Noise. Or we can go and whoop, if you hit C, you can bring up the uh, Node Commander. And let's just get some max on noise. <laughs> Plug that in here. Get rid of this just redshift noise. And now we have all of the, we're just going to plug this into the environment there. So now let's throw this on the redshift environment here. And you'll start to see that noise break this up now. And the cool thing is you can actually go into the noise and animate it, and you'll get this like nice undulated fog effect. Another thing you can do is if you have Forester, they actually allow you to have tree models where you can animate the leaves. Well, we just use these trees from Cinema 4D, uh, so they don't have animated leaves. But one really easy way to animate the, uh, animate the leaves, let's grab a tree here. Uh, let's grab uh, this one. I actually showed this to Beeple yesterday to help him out with his dollar bills. All you need to do is just grab uh, another displacer. And where is the tree? Let's reset transform. There's the tree. So we got our displacer here. We're going to load up some noise. Maybe make this a little bigger. And then we can just animate this noise. If you put in any other number in this animation speed than zero, it's going to have a little bit of, it's going to animate that noise. So now, let's pause this and zoom in here. Press play. And you can see all this nice little undulation of the, whoop, <laughs> of the leaves. The nice thing about uh, the original uh, the, the, the tree elements that come with the asset browser is I can actually just apply this to the leaves so it's not also displacing the tree bark as well because that just looks like an avatar weird tree thing. Uh, but now you just have this like fake like leaves blowing in the wind. And then if you remember, all of those like god rays that are filtering through our scene is filtering through those leaves. So now you not only have this like nice atmospheric fog that's animating, uh, but then you also have like the trees moving as well, so the, your shadows are going to be dancing as they would if a breeze was flowing through your scene. So I, again, like a, that could be like a nice, uh, graceful kind of uh, a bit of element here. So let's show that final bit there. So you can see the see all the animated volume. So that's all from those animated leaves. I actually didn't. The one thing I should have done is just animated the leaves on the back here as well. Uh, but I didn't do that. Uh, but then you can also see a little bit of that like nice noise animating there as well, which looks pretty cool. So you got this. I ad added some nice animation in the back here. So it's this animated fog. It's not static, uh, and looked pretty uh, pretty awesome. Uh, but wow, I went over. But I'm the last one. I can go as long as I want. The show floor doesn't close until like 
another hour. So. You could. Yeah. But that'd be rude. No, yeah. I'm just, no, no, don't be rude. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, you want to you get get them to a slide, and we yeah. have a special treat for everybody. Ooh. There we go. Yeah. So uh, I'm online at iDesign. Uh, on the web, on Twitter, on the Instagrams, on the YouTube. I'm always doing tutorials on YouTube. Uh, but if anyone has any questions about like anything Cinema 4D, or, or if you're too shy to like ask a question here, uh, you can totally hit me on Instagram, Twitter. Always down to help anything. The reason I, why I joined School of Motion is because I love teaching. So don't hesitate to, to ask me a question. I always love the people that like hit me up and ask me if they can ask me a question. I'm like, bro, you already you just asked me once, so just ask the question. <laughs> but uh, yeah, thank you all so much. Thank you, Maxon. Thank you, Matthias. It's so good to be back in person and see all your beautiful faces. Hopefully, we can keep doing this a lot more. But appreciate you all. Love this community. Love you all online. We'll see you again next year. Yeah. All right, EJ Hassenfrotz, folks. You might have some questions, though, so stick okay. around for questions. And the bonus is we're going to do a little um, couple quick tips, right? So we're going to do a little uh, tips and tricks. Is your scene still open? Yeah. Yeah, let's keep that open. We'll, we'll just okay. uh, we'll mess it up for you. Okay. So um, we do have uh, a lineup of some of our own trainers, some of our own artists, and we're just going to show you some stuff. Maybe you know it. Maybe you don't. Uh, maybe you at home could follow along, and we'll dive into that. But let me see. Questions for EJ. Survey says, EJ. When is the next Colorado Mo MoGraph meetup? Ooh, that's a good question. They happen every third Thursday, so next third Thursday. There we go. Yeah. And someone asked this. I don't know who asked. You didn't ask this question, Internet, did you? What renderer did you use? Like, didn't you just come on? Come on, Internet. Come on. No, no, Internet. Look at rewind. Mom, my, my mom always trolling in the comments. Like, uh, just come on, mom. <laughs> All right. Um, do I need to dis uh, do I need to enable the displacement in the Redshift tag every time I upload assets from Quixel Bridge? Uh, I believe so. I can't remember because I can't. We the, yes, I thought so. Yeah, because that's I mean that's one of the great things about Quixel Bridge is it literally sets up everything for you. Uh, but when you do have displacement, like I added the uh, textures to the ground. When you do that and you just bring in a, a material and it has displacement, you would have to manually go ahead, like for the, the close, for the landscape. This is the mossy forest that's got displacement on it. Whatever object I apply this to, which would be that plane object, I would have to make sure that I had added this tag, turned on into geometry, the override, and then in this. And the cool thing about, uh, the geometry tag as well as you can actually not only dis add displacement at render time, but you can actually subdivide at render time as well, which means that you don't have to have like a thousand width and segments uh, uh, dialed in here. You can actually subdivide using this tag at render time to like, s even smooth out that detail anymore with that tessellation option there. There we go. Uh, let's see. Are Macs up to the task for Redshift Octane, or do we still have to use PC? That's actually a good question. We actually, I, I need to test this right after I get off from here, but we have some of the Mac Studios out back. So what I'm going to do, if anyone wants to see, I'm going to load up this scene, uh, the, the, the end scene that I made here, and kind of compare and contrast, like how fast is it on the Mac Studio? How fast is it? So. Well, we'll find out, but I mean, it's, you're definitely going to get more bang for your buck with PC. I think that's always going to be the case. Uh, I just switched to PC uh, last year, a little over a year ago. I still love the Mac OS, and I hope they come out with a Mac Pro. But you can uh, use AMD cards. You can use Redshift on older versions of Mac. Same thing with Octane. And hey, if you like Mac and you don't have to do a lot of realistic lighting and do more stylized stuff that's not render intensive, then go for Mac. But if you're, if you're doing more like uh, physically realistic stuff, uh, you're, you're probably going to want to save yourself some time and get yourself a PC. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Am I wrong or does the final still have a painterly feel? Is that from post? Yes. Actually, I, I promised someone that I was going to show that. And I, I broke my promise. I'm a jerk. 
Don't be, uh, don't be a jerk. I know. So let me, let me show that really quick. So that was literally just the LUT. So a LUT is a lookup table. It basically just converts all of your, uh, your, your colors in your scene and kind of remaps it. So let's go to this final here. Let's fire up the Redshift render view. Let's move this here. And if you go over here <coughs> and go to the gear, you can also use Dread Giant looks and stuff for this too. So we got Magic Bullet looks baked right in here. Uh, but right here <coughs> is, turn that off, turn this off, turn this off. Whoop. I don't I might know how to do the, I'm used to the Wacom where I know how to zoom in with the thing. Wait, how do I, do you know how to zoom? I'll just do this. There That's exactly how you zoom. That's how you zoom. <laughs> uh, so this is looking pretty good, but again, based off of my references, right, I had that really nice greenish cast. So I wanted to try to recreate that. And literally all I did was like, I feel like, like, is this how everyone picks a LUT? You just literally go through here and like, just kind of like, whoop, and then go and do down and down and down no, and Not everybody. Down. I think Anthony Barry showed that like, if you know the exact camera you were looking for, you I, get a look. I don't know anything about cameras. So just hit the down button. Then. Yeah, I hit, the down, the <laughs> I hit the down button until I went to this ag, Agfa color and it got this really nice greenish cast. And you can see how bland that looks and how like nice and saturated this looks. And then I went to the c color controls and like added that. And you can like adjust your curves here. And then the photographic exposure, you can like kind of clamp your white values. Oh, the one other thing I did was I adjusted the white point. So if you want more greenish hue pumped into your scene, you'll want to go to uh, kind of the opposite color or actually, if you want blue, so right now I wanted to pump a little blue in here. I went and added a little bit of yellow. So it's on this yellow part here. And whatever color you're adding, you're actually adding saturation of the opposite color to the other side of the color wheel. So this is where you can get this like kind of cool, bluish, cool hue. So again, the emotion attached to color, like cool is cold. So this looks like, you know, like it could be the winter. This looks like totally different, and I can do the opposite too. Or if I want a greenish tint, I'll go over to purple, and you can get really greeny, Kermit the Frog. Uh, so that that was a, a nice thing to add on top of uh, to really get that nice stylized, and then a little bit of uh, bloom, where you got this nice, this little fuzzy, glowy. What do they call that? Where they add like the like a uh, bloom. Yeah, bloom, but like it's like, you know. Haze, fog. Like morning soap opera stuff where they add the nice. Vaseline on the lens. Yes. Yeah, that's what That's it is. that, yeah. So it just adds that type of look. Um, but red sh I, I'm, I'm really excited for Redshift uh, Tune shading, which should hopefully be coming soon. It's been on the roadmap. Hopefully I can demo that next NAB. Let's do it. Let's make it happen. Uh, but yeah. Great. All right, so then the last thing was somebody was wondering about hardware for like a laptop. I mean, Dell's one of our sponsors. I've been working on a Precision laptop. It has like an A5000 video card. So you want to just make sure whatever hardware you're looking at. Uh, <coughs> I drink me. it all. I just uh, drink all just, the water uh, no. just to spite no. you. <laughs> um, you want a uh, high-end video card, the best you can have if you're doing Redshift rendering, as well as uh, CPU and RAM. Those are going to be kind of the three things that you're really looking for. Um, that's a trifecta.